Hello everyone, Hunter Hicks. Today we're going to be looking at some of the treatment and causes of dementia. So let's talk about dementia. So dementia, remember, is a symptom, not a disease. And really those symptoms are going to be both cognitive, like memory, speech, but also motor issues as well. Now, dementia has a ton of different disease diseases that do cause it, such as like Alzheimer's disease, Lewy bodies from Parkinson's and stuff like that. Some of the more common causes, like we just said, is going to be Alzheimer's, Lewy bodies from Parkinson's, vascular dementia, but you can also get it with infection um, of the brain like meningitis. You can get it from secondary from HIV. You can get it from different medications like anticholinergics. Um, we can see dementia with a slew of different things. But the biggest thing is it's progressive, right? It's slower than we see with like delirium, which we could see sometimes with a stroke, we could see with hypoglycemia and stuff like that. So when we look at one of the causes, vascular dementia, this is just caused by decreased perfusion of the brain. This could be coming from a bunch of different strokes or hemorrhage or stuff like that. But this causes about around 10 to 15% of our dementia. Another cause here we see is going to be uh, the frontotemporal dementia, which we now call kind of Pick's disease. This is kind of a genetic abnormality where people genetically code those tau proteins, and then we find them in the uh, frontotemporal area. Uh, these patients tend to have a lot of uh, language issues, just comprehensive issues, and uh, different kinds of aphasia. Alzheimer's, here we go, one of the most common. Now, Alzheimer's, is gonna affect patients later in life, usually after 65 years of age, okay? Now it can happen early, we call this early onset, though rare, and if it does, it's usually genetically linked. Now we know there's a lot of familial um, uh, causes here, right? We know this is, a, this is a dominant gene, meaning if someone maybe in the family has it, like a mom or a dad, you possibly have a 50% chance of giving it to your next offspring. Now. The early causes or early onset dementia is usually caused from that. The rest, dementia happening after age 65, is caused from the physiology that we're going to go through here. Now, when we look at the physiology of uh, Alzheimer's, is we all probably know this by now, but we know we have our neurofibrillary tangles, right? And those are called by tau proteins that get tangled up. And then we have our beta amyloid plaques. Now those are kind of found throughout all the brain, but really where we're seeing it big is in the hippocampus, which we know is big for memory, and the cerebral cortex, which we know is big for speech, motor, and higher cognitive ability. Now overall, these guys are getting in the way, so we can't really give good messages from neuron to neuron, which is where we see some of our signs and symptoms, but also overall it creates stress in the brain and actually we have neuron death, okay? Other things that we've seen to happen here is these patients have issues with their acetylcholine, where we just don't have a degree of it or it's not working well, which is why a lot of the medications we give will help out with the acetylcholine. Now, as far as physiology, we know these patients will kind of progress um, further down the line, and we're going to look at that. So some of the subjective data is sometimes brought in by the family members or the patient, meaning that the Alzheimer's patient might not know that they have the dementia that's setting in, or they might, right? They might just uh, chalk it up to having some short-term memory loss. I'm like, oh, I forgot my keys again and again and again and again and again. But it's the family members that start to notice things like uh, he got lost on the drive home, which is weird because he always does that drive home. Or he's having issues doing things that he does every single day, and they'll start to notice those. So when we're doing the interview, right, we want to um, interview sometimes the patient by themselves or the family members are by themselves. Family members, because they'll tell us more and maybe not feel as bad talking about the family member. And then the family member themselves will tend not to cover it up because sometimes they're embarrassed, they don't want to admit that they're having this problem, and they'll be more likely to talk to you, and it's really keeping their dignity. So doing a good cognitive exam, right, testing their memory, what they do last Saturday, what they have to eat to, uh, for breakfast this morning, right? Their recent or remote memory. Uh, what they do last month on a certain day. Um, you can ask them FAQ. So these are going to be your uh, functional activities questionnaire, right? From that, you can ask them, like, are you able to do this by yourself or do you need help or can you do it at all? Kind of going through those as well. Then it's always good to ask the family members some of these questions, like, have you noticed any of this? Have you seen any of this? They're more likely to tell you as long as they're telling you. Um, possibly not with the family member around if they feel bad or stuff like that. 
Other subjective things, well, objective will go through here, but other things, you know, you're looking for any language issues, any vision issues, you might have smelling issues, that's later on, um, any motor problems uh, and stuff like that. As far as imaging, we can do different things like MRI to help you with your differential diagnosis. Uh, you can check uh, CSF fluid sometimes, look for those tau proteins. Um, and the beta amyloid plaques. Um, as far as other things like PET scans, which we know is our positron emission tomography, um, we can look for uh, those tau proteins and neurofibrillary tangles. It actually has been really good data on that, supporting patients maybe that are at risk that should get a PET scan. It can help them uh, uh, see how uh, their risk for Alzheimer's, or if you're just wondering on an Alzheimer's diagnosis. The hard thing is, a lot of these aren't covered by insurance, so something to keep in mind. Um, as far as diagnosis, there's really two common things we're using here. So we have the Montreal Cognitive Assessment Tool and then the mini cog. So the mini cog is where you're going to ask them three words, come back to them later, just like you would in your memory assessment. And then you're also going to have them draw a clock and then usually put a time on that clock with the two hands. Now this one's pretty good. It's got pretty good data if we're helping um, diagnose mild cognitive uh, disorders. Same with the Montreal Cognitive Assessment. Now this one takes a little bit longer, average about 10 minutes. You're going to go through all these things, naming, memory, attention, language, and they can score up to 30 points. Now, 26 points and above is considered normal. As we get less on the, um, or as the numbers get less and less and less, more likely to diagnose them with a mild cognitive um, abnormality, obviously dementia, secondary Alzheimer's. Both of these are great. The Montreal Cognitive Assessment is very um, well accepted around the world, especially um, if you look at different protocols like UpToDate and stuff like that. For different guidelines, super high percentage for helping diagnose these things. When we look at, sorry, when we look at treatment, the biggest two things we're trying to do is slow our memory loss for these patients and prolong independent function. Now, we got to focus on the patient because this is a holistic thing, right? They can have Lots of other things we haven't talked about, like psycho psychotic issues, like anxiety, paranormal, uh, depression, paranoia, sorry. Um, depression, they can have sundowning, which we see as like aggression and stuff like that. And also the family members are usually pretty stressed out dealing with this, so it's good to focus on both of them. So when looking at medications, we're gonna be using cholinesterase inhibitors. We remember that um, acetylcholinesterase is gonna break down our acetylcholine, so therefore if we block, cholinesterase and we get more acetylcholine hopefully that helps out these patients so examples of that are denepazil we have uh, rivastigmine is another good one um, a lot of these are good for mild and moderate alzheimer's whereas denepazil can kind of cover up to severe the idea here is more acetylcholine in the body we're going to slow memory loss and hopefully prolong independent function studies are out there guys maybe like one in ten patients this works on it also takes some time for this to work so you have to be patient Overall, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't with the medication therapy. Some of the adverse reactions we want to be careful of. We know that we're creating more acetylcholine, so we're going to work more on the cholinergic receptors. Well, all that becomes more with our cholinergic-like responses. So things like salvation, tearing, diarrhea. Um, we can see increased uh, uh, gastric acid secretion, so be careful if you're a patient of gastric ulcers. We can see bronchoconstriction, so be careful if you're a patient of reactive airway diseases like COPD and stuff like that. We then have our NMDA receptor agonist, which we have a team, right? And what that does is it increases glutamate, which is an excitatory neurotransmitter, hopefully to help out with overall cognition ability as well. Now, Parkinson's, another common cause of dementia, if we're talking about Lewy bodies. Now, Parkinson's usually is idiopathic, having later in life, more common in uh, men than it is women. When we look at Parkinson's physiology, there is the destruction of the dopamine neurotransmitter, which we know we get from the substantia Niagara. On top of that, we know we have less dopamine, and therefore we start to have more acetylcholine. It's kind of this imbalance between the two. Overall, we're having less dopamine, and that's really what we're looking at when we're treating it with medications for these patients. Now, outside of that, we can get these things called Lewy bodies, which we'll find, and that can cause a degree of dementia in these patients. So they don't just have the motor aspect, they can have the cognition aspect as well, which brings her into our subjective and objective. Now, I like to use TRAP when trying to diagnose Parkinson's. So these things are T for tremor at rest. That's a very common thing to see with these patients. And actually, usually the typical first thing that they're brought in for 
seen by their loved ones or whatever it might be is this tremor at rest, sometimes looking like a pill rolling tremor. Okay. R for rigidity, A for akinesia or bradykinesia, so without movement or slow movement, common things we see here as well. Postural disturbances, so they can get orthostatic hypotension and a lot of other autonomic issues. Their gait is something you want to be looking at. They can kind of be slunched over like this, and they kind of do this shuffling gait, and they sometimes freeze, which will then eventually go away depending on how much or depending on where the, the, the disease is. Mentally, they can have other issues like depression, which 50% of these guys usually do have. And it's hard because a lot of times their demeanor on their face is more of a flat A effect, which is hard because sometimes you don't know if it's a disease or depression you're working with. Other autonomic things you want to be careful of as far as the bowel, they can get constipation, they can get erectile dysfunction, and they can also get increased uh, urinary frequency, all things we want to be treating when dealing with these patients. As far as diagnosis, it's really your H&P that's going to be helpful here. Yes, you can do some different kind of scans and stuff like that if you're trying to rule out other different diagnoses. The biggest thing is you're looking for your Parkinsonisms. Parkinsonisms is the, the umbrella term we use for all of the um, motor symptoms we're seeing, being the tremor at rest, the bradykinesias, and the rigidity. If we have those three things, we're leaning more to our Parkinson's diagnosis as long as we're not on medications that might be causing that or different illnesses or stuff like that. Now, when we're looking at um, this as well, is when we talk about the medications we give like levodopa, it usually works so well that our patients will get better with their motor signs and symptoms. If they don't, you should question if your diagnosis is wrong, meaning it's not Parkinson's. Speaking of the medications, when we're doing our treatment overall, we're giving uh, medications like levodopa, uh, levodopa and then dopamine agonists. When we talk about levodopa, levodopa is not dopamine. It gets um, metabolized into dopamine when it crosses the blood-brain barrier. The issue with levodopa is only 1% of that actually can usually reach the brain because a lot of it is peripherally metabolized by different kinds of receptors. We can give medications to help block those different receptors like MOBs. However, what we do now is we just give carvedopa with levodopa. Carvedopa itself doesn't do much for us, but it does help decrease the overall amount of levodopa that is broken down. Therefore, we can give less of a dose to get the same dopamine effects. Now, why don't we just give dopamine itself? Well, one, it doesn't cross the blood brain barrier very well, and it has a really short half-life. Moving forward, levodopa itself does have a lot of signs, symptoms, or uh, adverse reactions we want to look out for. One of those things can be nausea and vomiting, super common to happen because we're increasing the dopamine in the body. That's why a lot of times the carbidopa will help out with that as well. We can also see a lot of dyskinesias, which is interesting because we give this to help out with motor problems, but in turn, we get motor problems with this. Therefore, um, a lot of times we get a drug called amantine to help out with those dyskinesias. Outside of that, with the nausea and vomiting, I want to make a note here. Um, it's be careful telling patients to eat with levodopa, which might help the nausea, but it actually decreases absorption a lot, and things high in protein will very well decrease absorption. Other things we can see here is um, stuff we don't worry about as much, like dark urine and dark sweat, not going to hurt them out as much. But we can see increased dopamine to cause different kinds of psychosis with these patients. We want to be really careful how we're treating that. And um, overall, we might have to decrease our dose. Now, one of our dopamine agonists, like uh, permapaxil or Requip, is something we can do that increases the dopamine levels in the body. We also can see this with asbestos leg syndrome as well, another medication we can give for that. Now, the goods and the bad. The goods is you're going to see less of the motor and uh, the dyskinesias with it. Doesn't interact with food as much like levodopa does. However, you are going to see more of the dopamine effects. So they're going to have daytime sleepiness. They could have um, just overall tiredness, sleep attacks. They can have more orthostatic or posterior orthostatic hypotension. All these things by increasing the dopamine levels in the body. So you just want to be careful when looking at that. Now, overall, guys, we want to know we have a lot to treat with these patients. Depression, sometimes like amitriptyline, a tricyclic antidepressant can be used. For their psychosis, we might just have to decrease that, but we want to be careful what atypical antipsychotics we're giving because they are going to have that effect on the dopamine. One that maybe we can give is Seroquel. Other things like our ur uh, urinary frequency, so like an anti our peripheral anticholinergic could help here. We want to watch our constipation, so keep their movements going as much as they can, keep their fluid intake, which also will help us 
with the orthostatic hypotension we can see so increase their salt increase their fluid intake if we can or sometimes we can prescribe a mineral corticoid to help out with that as well overall treatment guys is a lot going on here so a lot of times these guys are good referrals to neurologists